Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today is all about premier drums. I'm joined by Mike Ellis of Cambridgeshire in England. Mike, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Thank you for having me on. This is going to be awesome. Premier has been one of those companies that's been in the history of drums forever. And I know as a, an American here, I, I don't know much about them. I just know that they're very well-made, famous drums. Ringo started out playing Premier early on. Um, as you were telling me, you are a restorer of Premier drums and you run Blenheim drums. Yep. So why don't you tell us yes. about that a little bit and then we can uh, get into the history. Well, I've been um, uh, restoring and repairing drums uh, ever since I got my first drum kit when I was about eight years old, uh, I got the kit and within a day I'd taken it apart and put it back together because um, that's the sort of silly thing that I used to do when I was a kid. You know, I'd, I'd get something and take it apart, see how it worked. But normally I would leave it for someone else to put back together. But uh, in the case of the drums, if they wanted to play them, I had to put them back together. So it was quite um, an interesting uh, project for a very young chap to you know, take the whole kit to pieces and see how it all screwed together and, and put it back together. And I, I did a fairly good job of it. So I guess it was uh, something I had a, a natural uh, ability for. Yeah. Um, then um, when I left school, I went on to have a relatively successful, and as much I got paid for it, professional career up until, I'd say, uh, the early noughties when I was really a hobbyist. Um, repair, up to then repairing drums and I was doing favours for you know friends and other professionals uh, in restoring and repairing and I decided to uh, do it myself and set up a company which I did that company ran for probably about seven or eight years then I was headhunted to another company to head up their uh, I don't know how you describe it it was their their Musical Instrument Accessories Division, brackets, hmm. percussion clothes brackets, because they made all sorts of uh, fabrications out of steel and plastic and uh, what have you. And the chap who owned it was a guitarist. But what he really wanted to do is he wanted to make stuff for rock and roll people. He wanted, you know, he didn't want to rub shoulders with people who wanted shoulder straps for a, a garden. A strimmer or a lawnmower or something like that. He wanted yeah. to make guitar straps and and, it, and go to you know, drum shows and that sort of thing. So I, I, I got on board with them. Then I went out on my own probably in, I think it was 2012 when I set up on my own in a shed in the garden <laughs> uh, where we used to live, which was Blenheim House, which is why I took the name Blenheim Drums. And, uh, yeah, that's how I, I started. It's it sort of grown from there. I've got a big workshop here now uh, because we've moved to a, uh, a bigger property now, a, uh, a farm which is lovely and remote in the middle of nowhere <laughs> in the rolling English countryside. So uh, it's, uh, it's about the nearest neighbor's two miles away. Which is, wow. Uh, which is that lovely. is nice. You're in seclusion. And then I guess we should explain if there's any, like, internet glitches. I'm sure you're... You may have some internet uh, <laughs> slowdowns at it, points. It, it, yeah, it, it, it is possible. It's a bit steam powered out here, so uh, <laughs> that's funny. I'll, I'll, cool. if, it, if it does, I'll, I'll, I'll just shovel some more, uh, put a bit more coal on the fire, and uh, get the, uh, yeah. the internet up and running full speed. <laughs> then why don't we jump into the history of Premier Drums, one of the okay. absolute, dare I say, Premier brands of uh, in British yeah. drum history. Well, it's pretty much the, the, the main one. I mean, they are approaching their 100th anniversary in uh, 2022. Uh, they started in 1922 in a small workshop in uh, the centre of London. And they didn't actually make Premier Drums to start with. They made um, drums for a company called uh, J.E. Dallas and Sons, which uh, they were badge engineered, which means they made the drums and they put someone else's name on them, basically. Mm. Um, that was very, it was a very big company. And um, then after a few years, they started making their own drums. And through the 20s and 30s, the, the curve of development in terms of the um, technological advancements, not only at Premier, but all the other uh, drum companies 
uh, and in particular the American ones, was incredible. If you read the uh, brochures from the time, you look at like something from 1932 and they've got this fabulous new snare drum with a strainer on and this, that and the other. And then a year later, they've improved it. and You can see a lot of the modern um, components and technology, if you like, that we take, you know, on, which are on our drums now, was all being developed in them. Uh, one of them being chrome plating. You know, we expect everything, all the hardware to be chrome plated, whereas up until the mid 30s, I think it was, or the roundabout then, everything was nickel plated. Hmm. And uh, chrome, chrome was the big new thing, and we have all these uh, splashes about it. And it's the, the, the wonder of the age type advertising. Yeah. Then they, um, obviously, there was a little altercation at, at the end of the 30s, uh, which. Um, meant that the world decided to all start having a massive fight. So by now, Premier had moved to a very big factory in the north of London, and they were making gun sights, amongst other things. Interesting. For, uh, they were making gun sights for aircraft and for anti-aircraft guns. And obviously, this made them a target. And unfortunately, in November 1940, they became the subject of a lot of bombs uh, and the factory was destroyed and they weren't making any drums at the time or if they were it was in it was in very very small quantities and the british government deemed them to be a necessary manufacturer of great importance and there were many of them so they moved them up to leicester in the midlands so they were a bit further out of uh, range from the bombers and they set up a new factory, which is where they stayed until, well, about 10 years ago. And hmm. uh, then all, all production was transferred to the Far East. Oh, really? So, okay. Uh, no. So, in well, most companies now, most of their hardware, I think, and a lot of their their, their kits are made out uh, in the Far East. It's It's nothing unique. It's nothing unusual. It's just... That's the way the world has gone. So uh, yeah, gotta live with it. It is, man. I find that so fascinating. And people who've listened to the show in the past have have known. I feel like it's almost like a little side journey of this show is to find out what all the companies were doing during World War II, where Rogers was yeah. making like you know gauges for airplanes, and um, yeah, everyone yep. was doing different things. So it's really cool to know that Premier was making gun sights, um, and. Currently, like even modern day right now, I find it sort of like a parallel that like as we're recording this, it's April 11th, 2020, and it is the COVID-19 stuff going on. I find it very interesting that companies like Aquarian Drumheads and uh, Evans are making face masks out of the drum heads yeah, yeah. for people on the front line who are working in the hospitals and all that. So very it's, reminiscent. It, yeah, it's very, very timely. Uh, yeah, we're recording it at about the same time because they are being called in an in, uh, in national and international times of emergency. Yeah, um, people have to turn their skills to what is needed, and that's yeah. exactly what's happening now. And it happened in 1940 in Britain. Hmm. Let me ask you. So let's back up a little bit. I'm sure tons of other stuff has yeah. happened, but I just want to ask. So Premier started. You said in the early 1920s. Is that correct? Yeah, 1922. So at that time, were they mainly making like marching drums and things like that? Because that's really at the very beginning of the drum set, obviously. Um, yeah, really what they were making, when they first started, they were making snare drums. That was okay. really all they were doing. Because the drum set back in the uh, early 1920s, drum-wise, was a snare drum and a bass drum and then lots of toys because we were still deep into the um, the silent movie era. Yeah. And it, the the drummer was the special effects guy. So, uh, well, the sound effects guy, I should say. Yeah. Um, so the, it, we had the, um, the, the tray on the, on the top of the bass drum and the bass drum and the snare drum weren't really used in the way that perhaps we're used to, you know, in these modern times of um, playing. 
they were used uh, for effects and the tray on the front of them you only have to look at a, a catalog from premier or ludwig or anyone sure. who's around at the time and they've got duck calls train whistles slaps and all sorts of things that like what earth does that do it looks like a, a an instrument of torture but it's a sound effect <laughs> and that's what that is that is what the drummer was doing yeah and that was um his job and it wasn't until the sort of 1930s when the talkies came and when there had to be a, a big rethink, and that's why I say it's very interesting to read the the brochures and of uh, the 1930s to see how um, uh, drum companies responded to talkies and all the pit musicians being put out of work. Mm. It's very interesting, actually. I've got all the, um, the it's called the, the Drummer Magazine that Premier published. I've got them all from 1928 until 1939, when obviously. They had to stop printing them. And, yeah. um, when the talkies first came, they did an editorial, and as was the, um, it seems to be the thinking at the time, that the talkies were just a fad. They wouldn't catch on. <laughs> no, you know, <laughs> so weird. You've got nothing to you've got nothing to worry about. It's going to be business as usual, and um, you know, come and buy all your sound effects and everything. Of course, you know, within a couple of years, silent movies were, uh, were dead and buried. Yeah, guys, that's so cool. Because again, just like we were talking about with, you know, flipping the factory over to make, um, you know, gun sites, it's episode one yeah. of the podcast was about silent movie era drummers. And we're now in going on episode 50. So it's um definitely something I like to hear about. And I never really thought about it outside of America, which is probably very close minded of me. But of course, it's around the world. I, I mean, yeah, that's yeah. And, and it further expands the impact of silent movie uh the silent of talkies coming in and taking away the jobs of of these drummers thinking about it globally well, you, i mean well if, yeah if you think about how, how many cinemas there were i mean just in america how many cinemas there were every single town had one two or three cinemas and every yeah. single one of those had at least a drummer and other yeah. musicians and within, I don't know what it was, 18 months, two years, three years, they were all out of a job. Yeah. Just like that because of the, um, the talkies coming along. So put that on a global scale, and you can see why, um, you know, Kremi was saying things like, no, 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 don't panic, don't panic, keep buying this, this is, you know, it's just a fad. Because they were probably terrified as well. Yes. Thought, well, no one's going to be buying anything anymore because – there's not going to be any cinemas, but um, as it happened, mm. you know, we uh, music uh, moved in a different direction. Yeah, so then they pivoted, similar to um, your Slingerlands and your Leedies and your Ludwigs, where things pivoted and it turned more into what we think of as uh, it's getting more into that traditional drum set. So just as like yeah. the American will call them the Big Four, they were then starting to make the jazz outfits and things like that, right? Yeah, it didn't really happen in Great Britain until after the war, because oh, okay. um, obviously they, what happened was, along with all the servicemen who came over to serve and were stationed in the UK uh, during that time, they brought the music, they brought the records and everything. And obviously, you know, young impressionable musicians and drummers and uh, young people in general were hearing this you know, great new sound. Because it's also, it, it, it's hard to believe, and I don't think a lot of people realize, but even though America and um, Great Britain are on the other side of the world to each other physically, it yeah. really, I don't think people understand the actual psychological um, difference, you know, in terms of where, the way people in Britain regarded the Americans, because they really were. It might as well be from Mars <laughs> by today's standards. Yeah. You know what I mean? In terms of the, it's the actual physical differences and the, the, the physical distance, I should say, uh, and yeah. the cultural differences. And they brought all over this, um, this fabulous new um, swing and jazz and everything. The Premier were looking at what the American manufacturers were doing at the time. And obviously they were coming out with uh, these smaller kits that could be carried easy, easily because not many people had uh, cars 
Mm-hmm. The whole idea of having a, um, a residency, uh, I mean, I don't know if that was the same in, in America, but in the UK, bands tended to have a residency in a, a venue. So yeah. you could set up the kit and, and leave it there. And that was it. Yeah. It was there and, until you moved to somewhere else. And some of these venues, I remember when I was small, I went into one um, up in Manchester, which is from where I'm from originally, when they were redeveloping this old, it, well, it was a theatre, and it, there were three floors, and each wow. floor had an, auto, an auditorium, a stage, seats, and the balconies. You know, the, uh, you know I don't know if you've seen the old Victorian style balconies, and sure. the huge high ceiling, and there were three of them stacked one on top of each other in this place. It was just uh, amazing. And if you think in the 20s and the 30s, there were three bands. You know, all resident in there playing uh, the stuff, and I think it went on in the in the forties and the fifties as well. But obviously, the configuration of the kit changed quite dramatically. The um, the, the skull, uh, the skulls along the front went. The special effects all went. I mean, um, it was Gene Krupa when he, he came out with the template for the kit, wasn't it? That Slingerland in nineteen thirty six. Um, I mean, if you look at that kit that he came up with, that's just a modern kit, that. It you know, is. Modern four piece kit. Uh, mm. And it's, um, you know, despite the extravagances of the 70s, uh, it's, that's how it's been ever since. And um, But Premier were a bit, as were the other British manufacturers at the time, because we still had, um, still had Dallas and Ajax and a handful of others, were a bit slow off the mark. And um, it wasn't really until the 50s when they really sort of got to grips with the idea of the what we would call the modern drum kit. Gotcha. That's interesting. Man, the, the impact of Gene Krupa just never fails across, again, the, the globe oh. of just someone who's early, like almost Absolutely. like Ringo for us, where we yes. see Ringo and then it goes, oh, my God, I'm going to play the drums. That's like he's the predecessor to that of just getting people excited about the drum set. Absolutely pivotal, and it cannot be, you know, uh, overestimated. It cannot be, you know, igno- ignored or, you know, understated because he, he, he was Gene Krupa. Without him, we might not be doing what we're doing now the way we're doing it. He yeah. absolutely looked at the drum kit and went, right, this has got to change. You know, it's the difference between um, a propeller driven plane and a jet driven plane. Uh, mm-hmm. I can't think of any other comparisons um, uh, of uh, in, in modern yeah. times. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Su- yeah. Such a, a huge quantum leap forward. Uh, and yeah. like you say, with Ringo, um, it was the beginning of the beat boom, and that obviously that had a, an enormous worldwide uh, effect. And um, it is to my eternal sadness and regret that he didn't keep his premier kit. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I had Gary Astridge on the uh, show recently, who um, great oh, Beatles great. historian. Yeah, I, know, I know Gary quite well. Uh, yeah, and just to hear him talk about that and how it just you know he's like I guess he traded in the uh, premier kit I believe at Drum City right then it it yeah <laughs> it's like what I actually recently saw that someone was selling it I believe um, on Reverb dot com or one of these music websites they were selling what was believed to be. Ringo's uh, premiere kit, and I'm just thinking, like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's loads of them out there, honestly. Yeah, yeah. there's, there's lots, lots of um, genuine premier um, Ringo's premier mahogany kits, just like there's lots of Keith Moon kits, there's lots of John Bonham kits, all genuine, yeah. all absolutely, you know, the real thing. So, uh, yeah, you know, you pay your money, you take your risk, but, uh, oh. Yeah. Well, it's funny you said Keith Moon. I mean, we're we're going to jump we'll we'll move ahead into yeah. like the rock days, but man, when I think of Premier, uh we always talk about it on the show too about how a brand can explode, i.e. Ringo and Ludwig, but I think Keith Moon and Premier. Um they obviously go yeah. hand in hand. Um so that he he was such a great ambassador for the brand. Oh, he and still is. Yeah. He still is. He still absolutely I, I think he, he still shifts units for them. He still keeps the interest uh alive because 
he is such a character, so distinctive, and he just looks so great behind that, you know, those double bass drum kits. Yeah. And it, the interest is still absolutely huge. And as someone who is old enough um, to remember when he died, uh, I think it, it's very difficult to get over the immense shock and sense of loss when he died. Yeah. That everybody felt it was just absolutely. I mean, we weren't surprised, no, to be honest. Sure. Um, but it was absolutely uh, because they just released an album. They just released uh, Who Are You a couple of weeks before. And they were on TV with their promotional videos. So it was a very happening time for the band. They were you know, back in the charts. They were doing well. And tragedy struck. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable to me how young he was as just uh, as a man. Oh, yeah. I mean, he was 32, right? Like every... every- Honestly, lots of people really are shocked when they find out. You know, if you don't know younger people, go, he was 32, but I thought he, you know, he was in his 50s or something. <laughs> he had such an impact, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, on, uh, on, the, on the music industry. He looms large, like this incredible legend. I mean, if you think about what he did in his tragically short life, all the albums, he did movies as well. I yeah. Some of them were absolutely garbage but nevertheless <laughs> as the time he, you know you know he, he's made more movies than i have uh so <laughs> sure. not that that's a boast you know that <laughs> yeah, we've made one <laughs> should, be, should be proud of but yeah. nevertheless uh yeah. but he did he, he had such a, a huge impact but he was um you know he was 17 when the who started oh my god well that explains so it's like you start so young then you're in it, yeah. so I mean, and same with John Bonham, obviously, where they both died very, very young, yeah. similar age. Yes, it's yeah. just tragic. I mean, it's I just turned thirty, yeah. so I'm like, man, I can't imagine that. I mean, I it's just unbelievable. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, it, it is. It, it's very sad, but um, yeah. But he did great well, things for you know, Premiere. He, he, he did great things for Premiere. Yeah, the the kits. It's um, it's quite a, a thing. I don't know if it. It happens over your side of the pond. There's a lot of people who want to build replica kits. Now, a few years ago, Premier did a Pictures of Lily replica kit, uh, which was pretty much universally derided by all the uh, Premier snobs and aficionados because they used the wrong lugs on it. They didn't use the right ones, which I think was a was a big mistake. Yeah. But, it was a tri- it was a tribute kit, sure. and I think if they just if they just gone the extra yard and said, "Look, we could actually do this properly," um, but unfortunately, a lot of the the dies the casts for the uh, lugs were were lost when uh, they were merged with Yamaha in the eighties, um, and the, a lot of stuff was a lot of machinery and tooling was scrapped, so uh, hmm. it might have been a bit difficult for them to do it. But so anyway, back to Keith. Um, yeah, and things like his um, his red sparkle kit is the uh, one of the um, what's the word legendary kits. You know the iconic kit. That's the word. Yes, iconic. Yeah, kits. definitely. Um, and then there was the um, pictures of Lily kit. Uh, I don't know. Have you ever seen the clip from the American show, the Smothers Brothers? Yeah, where they packed the bass drum too tight and they blew it up. why don't you yeah. explain it so if people listening you know anywhere haven't seen that or they're young and they they're, they haven't seen it um why don't you give us a rundown of that because i think that's a piece of history which premiere is very much involved in okay well first of all there were two pictures of lily kits not many people know this but there were two identical kits and this is an example of why there were two kits the who were doing an appearance on this tv show the smothers brothers and Keith came up with this fabulous idea to pack one of the bass drums with explosives. Now, legend has it that they got the stagehand or whoever it was who was the expert <laughs> in explosives to put a little bit more in. Apparently, brandy was involved, <laughs> the drink. Yeah. And um, he, he put a little bit more in than perhaps he wanted to or should have done. 
And at the uh, the end of the song, when they were doing their traditional uh, smashing up of instruments, Keith hit the ignition switch. Unfortunately, the moment this happened, Pete Townsend's head was quite close to the front of this drum, the bass drum, and it was, as you look out from the kit, it was the left-hand bass drum. This bass drum was blown into shreds, as was nearly Pete Townsend's head. Yeah. And it, it was absolute pandemonium. And you can see, if you watch the unedited broadcast of it, the guys, the, the, the presenters came on because they were going to do a, a little, I think, a little bit of a comedy routine. Um, Keith got blown off the back of the, 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 the drum riser, and he suffered some injuries because a cymbal got blown over and he cut his arm. Uh, he got quite a, a, a bad cut on his arm. Um, poor old Pete Townsend didn't know what day of the week it was. Hmm. Uh, and he, he maintains to this day that's where he his hearing damage really came from. Because yeah. it, it's, it's quite actually very scary to watch the, the footage because his head was right in front of the, um, the resonant head of the bass drum. And it just, bam, yeah. it's like when a bomb goes off, it is huge the explosion is huge and because all sorts of chaos and um I, i'm not sure if they're ever invited back <laughs> no but the the kit the kit so you could see the kit was really the, the front of it was absolutely torn apart um there were, the, it was like uh, almost something from you know warner brothers cartoon where you know he puts his finger in the end of the gun and pulls the trigger and the the end of the barrel splays out. Yeah, exactly. It looked like it looked it looked like that, and um, yeah, it was uh, it's it's legendary. It's enormously funny because no one was seriously injured, but at the time, you can imagine that it oh, it must have really uh, it must have caused them a lot of problems. Yeah, it's I mean, great, it's great fun to watch now. It is. It it wouldn't be fun if it killed someone. Obviously, I mean, it, which it very well could well, have it, done. It, it could have done quite easily, yes. It was. It, I mean, this was one of um, Keith's traits, you know, this uh, just going taking everything just a little bit too far. But, uh, yeah. He, you know, he got away with it yeah. that time. So um, let's kind of go back into the timeline of Premiere here. So obviously yeah. – 40s and then post-war you said they got more into the like traditional jazz kind of jazzer drum sets um and then into the 60s we're looking at more obviously they're building kits like rock kits of that time for drummers like keith moon and all that stuff um yep yep and uh were they still you you mentioned later they were sold were, were they still independently owned and operated as a as a you know as a british oh they, yeah they've they were owned, family owned, from their inception right up to the end of 1983. Okay. It was a family, a family owned company. Um, and, um, there's uh, some quite hair raising stories about uh, the end of that because I've been fortunate to be able to talk to uh, quite a lot of people who actually worked Premier at the time. Hmm. Um, some of them, unfortunately, who are no longer with us because time marches on and all that. Yep. But uh, I've made extensive notes for my life about these things. So uh, yeah, the the um, it was it was it was family owned. Uh, when they came out of um, World War Two, it was a really it was a fresh start. They had to, and they came up with all these new designs and with the the skills that they had uh, perfected with the accuracy of making things like gun sights, as I mentioned earlier, transfer, uh, was transferred into making. The, the the drums and they were very adept at die cast molding which is why their stands their first set of stands that came out at the in the 40s were all had die cast legs had steel tubes whereas everyone else would press steel hmm. so they had the die cast legs these were developed through the 50s as was the range of drums and again the looking at the Brocious from the fifties. It's it's interesting to see the, the the developments and how they were sort of really. I think they were trying to keep up with the the American companies. I don't think it's um, it's unfair about Premier to say that, but 
they had one big advantage over the American companies in the UK and a lot of territories over the world was because Britain still had what was left of what was called used to be called the Empire. Mm -hmm. And it was now called the British Commonwealth. And in order for people like Rogers and Ludwig and Gretsch and everything to sell their products into Britain and these territories, they had there was enormous purchase tax on them. Because at the end of the war, Britain was broke, and the it was export or die. We had yeah. to set, we had to make stuff, sell to get foreign money in. Yeah. So uh, everybody was actively discouraged from buying stuff made overseas by British. You had to buy British, and you had to export, which meant through the fifties, companies and Premier were no different uh, to say like a, a, an automobile. Company the vast majority of production went overseas. And this was pretty much through the 50s as well. So all these uh, kits, a lot of them, went to you know the, the four corners of the earth in order to get foreign money into the country in order to uh, pay off the debts that we'd run up during the, uh, the conflict. Hmm. Um, so they were following very much what the Americans were doing, you know, Gretsch, um, Rogers and uh, in particular Ludwig um, or Reedy and Ludwig or whatever they were called at the time because I know they went through a few uh, ups and downs oh, yeah. during that time. Big time. And uh, Yeah, yeah. So it was still during the 50s it, jazz was uh, the, the big thing in the late 40s and through to the mid 50s and that was the, the, the big thing and then of course Elvis Presley, Bill Haley came along, Buddy Holly, and it, it changed again. And interestingly, as I said earlier, you know the way Premier said um, in the with the talkies, they went, "Oh, it's just bad." It, you know, yeah, these talky pictures. Don't worry about it. They said exactly the same thing about rock and roll. They were they were yeah. just not interested. And I have this um, person from talking to people who were working there at the time and said they just weren't interested in pop music or rock and roll. They said, no, it'll be uh, it'll be all over in a few weeks. And, you know, this is jazz and swing and proper bands. That is the way it's going to be. And it was the same right up to well, 1964. And only then did they suddenly go, actually, I think this um, this this pop music beat combo thing is is going to be um, quite important to us. So we really need to respond to it. And you can see it because that's about the time that the Beatles had really, you know, conquered the world. Yeah. And you know, Ludwig were on twenty four seven manufacturing. Uh, the purchase tax, the import taxes uh, into the UK had been slashed by the government. So suddenly you could get uh, Ludwig drums in the UK. And they they had to. They had to respond. And you can see it because it, the 1963 brochure is pretty much the same as the 1962 and the 1960 and the 1958. It's all very patriarchal and very sort of stiff. You know, these drums are very... But they're jolly good, you know. You really yeah. ought to be using them. They're, they're much better than, than anything those foreign Johnnies are making. It's uh, and really very just typically stuck in the mud British. Sure. Uh, we 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 do everything better than anybody else. Don't be an idiot by our stuff. And then in 1963, 1964, the catalogue. Well, if you see it, if you're going to have a look at it online, suddenly they've got girls. You know, the typical, what you call archetypal 60s model girls, you know, draped across the kits. So obviously someone had come along and said, come on, guys, you know, they blew the cobwebs off the boardroom yeah. table and said, this is, you know, this is happening. It's going to, it's going to stick. It's going to be, you've got to be on board with this. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I sense that they were quite resistant to it because, there was another problem that Premier had, which is still a problem to a lot of people today. They had their own unique sizes. Now, you may have heard of these. They're called pre-international size drums. Now, what that means is they only made 
uh, say we'll take uh, the Tom Toms. In the 50s, they made it a 10, a 12, and a 14, right? The 14 was standard 14 inch. So you could take any 14 inch head you like, you could put it on. The 10 inch, its diameter was 9 and 5 eighths of an inch. The 12 inch was 11 and 5 eighths of an inch. And the only heads that would fit them were the heads made by Premier. Oh boy. And they. And the, there was a, a there was a pre international uh, twenty inch which they got rid of in the early sixties and made it international size. Um, they had a, a pre international sixteen inch floor tom as well. I mean, they I don't know what they were on or what they were thinking, but they had uh, two sixteen inch floor tom sizes. So it was a sixteen inch diameter by fifteen inches deep, and um, sixteen inch diameter by eighteen inches deep. So those were the two floor tom sizes that you could get. But it wasn't 16 inch diameter. It was 16 and a quarter inches. Man. So again, you had to put their own heads on. Now, in the 40s and the early 50s, it didn't matter because everyone was using calf heads. So when you needed to replace the head, you just went along to your local calf head lapper with your flesh hoop and he put a new head on it for you and everything was fine. And they stuck with these sizes until 1968. Wow. Can you believe that? Wow. Man, so it's just like a proprietary thing, kind of like with nowadays you could almost say like with like Apple products, like smartphones. It's like you're going to use our charging stuff and it's not going to work with anyone yes. else. But Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. I can imagine how frustrating it is. I mean, one of the things that I hate as I, as I advance in years is – all the different plugs you've got to have for all the different yeah. bits of technology. It drives me absolutely oh, to distraction. Yeah. Why, why Why is that plug got to be like a quarter of a millimeter wider than that? Or why can't we all just get together one day and go, right, okay, yeah. we're all, uh, everything's going to be the same. Well, I've, so, heard, yeah. I've heard that same thing about early um, – uh, early American brands, like I think I heard it about Leedy, where they would have like like we talked about painted drum heads in one episode on the twenties, yeah. and it would be like yeah, this Leedy bass drum would be twenty four inches and three quarters, and this is and uh, so I don't think that was they were alone in that, but I guess it, it sort of did, uh, you know, they well what yeah what they did though their big their big their silly mistake was to stick with it yeah. For 10 years after all their competition had gone to standard sizing and it was it was even um the other british companies that were still around at the time were standard sizes mm -hmm. they bought um the, well the the owner of uh premier one of the owners of premier bought a company called beverly drums yeah um in 1958 and what it was um beverly they got into the drum company, uh, the, the drum business, because the, the, the well, I'll go back a bit further. The company that they bought was called Deans and Sons. And Deans and Sons have been around for, for years, and they were steel fabricators. And one of the things they made in the early part of the 20th century was um, handles, grab handles out of steel for buildings, you know, for staircases. Yeah, and they also made them for the buses, you know, the London buses. So those um, grab handles you get going up the stairs to the upper deck, they were all made by Deans and Sons, and they made them for all the bus companies in the UK and all around the world. These steel tubes. Now, the other great user of steel tubes in the 1920s were drum companies for the consoles. So Beverly started making drum consoles. And after a while, they were making because they were making them for other drum companies in the uh, in the UK, and um, I think they actually made them for Gretsch as well, I believe. Because I'm sure Chick Webb may have had one, or he might have had a Premier one. I can't remember off the top of my head. But anyway, um, so it was a, a fairly easy um, adaptation for them to make to make these enormous curved steel chrome tubes. And obviously, after a while, they went, well, why don't we make drums as well? You know, that's, it, it, it's not a, a, a big uh, 
uh, leapfrog them to make, I suppose, in manufacturing to make some steam wooden tubes. So that's what they did. And they were also making music stands for schools and colleges all over Britain and all over the Commonwealth. And they had the exclusive contract. So that was worth millions. And the boss of Deans and Sons in the 50s wanted to retire, but he had no family to leave company to. So one of the Premier Board got wind of this and bought the company ostensibly to get the music stand contract. Hmm. But they also acquired the, the drum company. So they set up uh, Beverly Drums as a, as a separate company. We've never owned by Premier. It was set up as a separate company with a, a manager appointed. And even they had standard sized drums uh, it, it eventually, because when Premier started making their drums, they, they gave them all the pre-international sizes. But John Kaywood, who I, uh, I was fortunate to, to speak to about 10 or 15 years ago, he wanted to make um, Beverly proper competitors to Ludwig. Of course. So he basically copied Ludwig. He, he wanted to copy Ludwig. Yeah. And, um, well, there's, there's another big story, coming, interesting story coming with this as well, which uh, that just popped into my memory. So he, um, so he basically, he really forced the issue on um, getting Premier to make proper standard international sized shells, uh, you know, to drag them kicking and screaming into the, the, the you know, the late 20th century. But he, um, these Beverly drums were, he, he, he freely admitted, and he made no bones about it, he was copying Ludwig because at the time Ludwig were the biggest thing on the planet because yeah. of Ringo. And he copied their finishes. He, he went as close as he could to copying their lugs without copyright inf infringement. And he went over to a Chicago drum show with one of his kids. Um, and over to his stand wandered William Ludwig. I think it must have been the second by mm. then. Bill Ludwig, the second. Yeah. And um, he was, and he said he was very nice. He was very polite. And he went off to a, a side room and he took with him what was called at the time a snare drum called the Cosmic 21. And these uh, 21 snare drums have reached a, a legendary status with collectors of British drums because they are a 400 copy as near as damn it. Hmm. In, in, and a lot, a lot of people say in sound as well. Now, I'm not going to get into whether or not it sounds as good as a 400 because I know I'll get myself into all sorts of trouble, uh, death threats and <laughs> all that sort of thing. Yeah. You're on your farm. Uh, you're secluded. You're safe. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Well, I don't know. I just think, you know, one day if I, if I said something like that, you know, there'd be helicopters hovering out in the, in the orchard or something and uh, yeah. some guy hanging out with a, with a, with a very large gun. But anyway, <laughs> um, the, uh, it, so he, he went off to this room and the, and Bill Ludwig took the drum apart and he had a inspection of it and he said, that's a really nice drum that, it did really, really well, very impressed and off he went. And John said he didn't mention once that it was on an almost faithful replica bar one or two very small differences to the drum that his company was making. Anyway, wow. spin on a few years. And I remember talking uh, on a, a drum forum many years later. Now, I don't know how true all of this, so I've sort of assembled this from a number of different sources. But I remember somebody telling me, or reading it somewhere, that certain Ludwig 400s are from the 60s are really pitted, and others are not so pitted. And then ones from the early 70s are really pitted, and so on and so forth. So there seems to be a batch, apparently, that are not nearly as pitted as others. Well, that's easy enough. You put that down, you know, it's just that's the way, you know, chrome is. Chrome and, and alu, you know, are not very good bedfellows and will eventually part company. Sure. Now, as I'm sure you know, and all your listeners know, but I will tell you anyway, one of the great things about Premier, one of its most famous attributes, it's outstanding chrome work. 
And legend has it, and I've never managed to pinpoint any proof of this whatsoever, but they, the Chrome shop was owned by the family, the Delaporte family, but it was not part of Premier. And they used to do the Chrome work for Rolls-Royce grills. Mm. You know the grills at the yeah. front of the car? Yeah. And that was one of their sort of, that's why it was set up as a different company, so they could do you know, other stuff yeah. as well as the, uh, the drum stuff. Uh, and it is, it is, it's hard to deny it is outstanding compared with uh, many others. On another occasion, I was chatting with a, a chap. Unfortunately, he's one of those who's no longer with us. And unfortunately, the email that he sent me, I lost in a quite tragic computer meltdown a few years ago. Um, so it's only my say so and, um, uh, my memory. Yeah, sure. But he told, he told me that a two container loads of beaded 14 by 5 inch chrome alu shells left a certain drum factory in Leicester destined for a certain drum factory in Chicago. Oh, man. In around 1967, 1968. Wow. And that's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. Jeez. So perhaps the very famous Ludwig Superphonic 400 snare drum had uh, a little bit of premiere in its uh, in its history. Well, you you might you could say that. I couldn't possibly come. I, I really I couldn't say with any degree. Yeah, we want to keep you safe. We want to <laughs> keep you safe out in your uh, in the farm and uh, not have you attacked by uh, Ludwig. Yeah. <laughs> Well, th this yeah. Well, this was a guy who was a. Uh, I'm not going to name him because he's not around anymore to you yeah. know, correct me or refute it. But he was a very big player in the international drum scene, and he worked with a lot of the big names, including Premier, and we became sort of correspondents mm. uh, up until his um, unfortunate and uh, quite premature passing uh, a few years ago. But um, well, yeah, he. Uh, he, he he definitely said that there was two container loads, and that and that's how he worded it. And well, let me yeah. fill in the blank. So I that's think how I will leave it. I think it's cool. People can take it or leave it. I just think it's neat now that we're kind of putting it out in the world uh, and and passing it along as kind of an oral history of is this true? Is it not yes. true? Um, so now it's yeah, you know. Well, that's a great uh, British author. Um, Douglas Adams once said about um, he was from his book The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy about some um, uh, questionable claim that somebody was making. He said uh, it was uh, wildly apocryphal or just a load of BS. You know, you can you can make your choice. It's urban legend or it is the truth. But the fact that uh, this guy said it to me. Uh, or you know, wrote it to me that um, that that is what happened. Yeah, and I I just made the connection with this discussion that um, Ludwig fans were having about why is it some of these drums get really really pitted and then some of them from the, this date aren't and then after, the ones after this date are really really pitted. Hmm. I don't know. It's just some of the pieces maybe. Yeah, fit maybe yeah. maybe who knows. There's there's a little bit of Rolls Royce in some of the uh, some of the nice ones, which is funny. Um, yeah, <laughs> they did say in the seventies, didn't they? Well, certainly the advertising in, on this side of the pond, um, Ludwig claimed to be the Rolls Royce of drugs. So, uh, <laughs> man, the conspiracy theories keep getting deeper and deeper here. Um, oh, I've got loads. I've got loads of them, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> going for days. That's funny. That's another podcast. I, I've also heard too yeah. about how um, there's a Brazilian <laughs> company, Penguin or Penguin Drums, that made very, very, very uh, uh, true to form Ludwig replicas um, going back, I think, to the 50s. And I'm pretty sure it would be Bill Ludwig II, I believe. So B2 would have seen yeah. them. He, I think he saw them and said, these are amazing. These are the best replicas I've ever seen. Um, and so on and so forth. So I, I don't think he was very much like a, um, I'm going to take this 
replica and squash you. You know, I think right. he yeah. admired. So that's that's the kind of the second time I've heard that story of him seeing something and not losing his mind out in anger, but but rather saying this is this is well done. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd never met the guy. I don't know anything about him, but um, he, he does seem to be. I mean, it, 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 is it Bill Ludwig the Third? Yeah, the, uh, he's yeah. yep. He, I, I'm friends with him on Facebook. Uh, we've never actually met, but in our exchanges, he, he seems like a you know a really, really, really nice guy. And I suspect it's a family trait. So I don't think it's the stretch of the imagination to say that. Um, you know, the, his uh, his ancestors were were equally uh, nice people. Oh yeah, no he yeah he's been on the show. He's a very nice guy, and 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 WFL three drums are beautiful, and uh, everyone should check those out as well. Yeah, so. yeah, sure. Oh yeah, they're great. They look they look wonderful. They look really nice. Yeah. So let's um let's move it on forward and kind of take it through. I think that okay. was a great, like uh, <laughs> some some good. Some, we got some controversy in the episode now. So so. You said they were owned, okay. um, family owned until 1983. So what happened from 83 and then, and then maybe bring it on uh, up to the modern days? Okay. Well, before we do that, we've got to do the seventies. Oh yeah. Because that is another thing. And unfortunately it kind of involves Ludwig again. Um, what happened was in the early seventies, Premier made a deal with Selma, yeah. who I'm sure you're familiar mm-hmm. with. To be the U.S. distributors, and um, basically what happened was Selma, as far as I can make out with any degree of accuracy, were became shareholders in Premier, hmm. and they had someone on the board uh, in the U.K. And this was at the time when Premier had committed to building their new purpose-built factory, which was it was supposed to be something like a quarter of a million pounds in nineteen. 19- 66 when they announced it by the time they moved in in 1976 it had cost uh, several times more maybe two or three million i don't know because wow. we had you know rampant uh, inflation there was you know the oil crisis there was all sorts of uh, political and social problems going on in the uk at the time um so they were really i think uh, financially stretched but having said that, the 70s is what a lot of people consider to be their golden age when they actually they really got it so right. Mm. And you only have to look at from sort of the, say, the 1969 brochure up to the 1980 brochure. And they're just, you can see they've got it right. They look good. They're presented well. They've got all this the silly sizes out the way. They had decent hardware. They had the beautiful lock fast flush base hardware. They had the, the tri-lock um, uh, uh, high, uh, the tripod um, hardware. And all of this, all this stuff was just so well made. I mean, the, the tri-lock hardware was made almost entirely of steel. All the collars were pressed steel. The only things that were cast were the uh, hand nuts and the little tilter on the top. Hmm. Everything else was made out of pressed steel, and there was little plastic inserts and rubber feet. Sure. But they they were just so incredibly well built. Um, and people, I mean, I've still got a set today. They're 40-plus years old, and they are as good as, if not better, than what we're getting from the Far East now, because there's no what we call uh, cast parts from monkey metal. Yeah, you know this really cheap, low grade um, castings that's you know of no use to man the beast in any other industrial application. Yeah, um, and they really were they really got on top of the game and they were keeping up with all the other companies, everything else that. The other companies, and in some cases, they were getting ahead of the game. They were nosing ahead. Um, but what happened was they got to the early 80s, by which time the invasion from Japan was really starting to bite, mm-hmm. uh, and in particular from a company called Pearl, which we all know and love now. Yeah. And they had to really rethink 
the what they were doing in order to compete because up until then they'd had Olympic drums which were their budget line and basically Olympic drums were just as good as Premier drums they just cut a few corners by instead of having die cast hoops they had steel hoops they had smaller and less lugs on them so the bass drum had six lugs instead of eight or ten that sort of thing they made savings but the shells were the same as top line kits it was exactly the same so for all intents and purposes they sound exactly the same and they got to the early 80s where they really had to do something to try and stave off the the problem of the uh the invasion by pearl who'd come in with the export and they, they were just you know sweeping the board yeah everyone everyone was buying pearl so they came up with um well it kind of illustrates the kind of panic they were in they came up with a kit called the disco now i don't know about you but in 1982 when they called it the disco i was around at the time disco was dead in 1982 <laughs> yeah you know, a little after the fact you might, you, you might as well have, have, have called it diphtheria or <laughs> measles it was really uh, anyway, Needless to say, they had a rethink. It was uh, the same kits were available, I believe. And again, it's one of those great things about Premier. Can't actually get complete and utter confirmation, but they were shipped to America under the Senator banner for mail order only. Hmm. So you can mail order yourself a, a, a budget Premier kit, but we had little Senator badges on it instead of um, Disco. Yeah, that's um, a little better. Still, still not the yeah. best name for a drum set. Yeah, no, it's better now. And you won't be surprised to know that the disco name was dropped less than a year later. Yeah, and it became and it became. Wait for it, the Royale. That's better. So now that has that. Yes, so somebody had actually had to think about it. Now what they also did was they introduced another line just above it. Uh, this budget line, because this budget line was, they were making it from, well, basically the same with that Pearl were making their exports out. It was, um, I think it's Philippine Mahogany called Luan or Maranti. Um, and um, it, it depends what where you come from or what wood shop you go to, mm-hmm. what name they give it. But um, it's basically a, a, cheap, um, uh, a cheap mahogany. But they brought in another one. Another line just above it, which had um, birch, which is their tra- traditional wood of choice for shells, yeah. uh, inner plies and outer plies, but it still had the core of uh, the mahogany. And this was called the crown. Now you can see they were getting the, they're getting the names a bit better. Yeah. And it sort of fitted with the British heritage and all that. Yeah, really? Yes. Well, the big problem that ha- occurred now was... Selma, at the end of 1981, had bought Ludwig drums. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to have to fill in some gaps here because I don't know exactly what happened, but I think it's safe to assume that Ludwig would said to Premier, right, we're off, mate. We don't need you anymore. We've got a drum company here back in our homeland. So we're going to pull our board member out and we're going to sell our shares in the company. I think what happened was the the family panicked and they bought the shares from Selma in order to keep the ownership uh, in in you know in the family. Gotcha. And unfortunately, this seems to ring true because at the end of 1983, the receivers were called in because they'd gone broke. They'd run out of money. And it appears that all the pension funds that all the employees had been paid into were gone. So and I, I, there's, there's a few people I've spoken to who are still absolutely enraged by this now because they, they were paying into this private pension fund with the company on the proviso that when they reach retirement age, they would have enough money to to live out the rest of their lives but all this money was gone and um 
there, I think it was probably used by uh, Selma. Mm. So that's, uh, but again, I must stress, I must make this absolutely clear, that is only speculation on my part. So I've got a little bit of evidence. I've got a fact here. I've got a fact there. Yeah. I've got somebody's testimony here. I put them together and you fill in the gaps and you put them together and you say, well, it kind of fits. It mm-hmm. kind of makes sense from what people have told me and what happened and what you what you know that is in printed form in the contemporaneous music publications. Um, it, it, it fits that that is possibly what happened, but I wasn't there. I don't know. So, uh, but yeah, there's some great stories of the um, the day that it all happened and people running out into the car park with papers under their arms and throwing things into car trunks and driving off at high speed. <laughs> oh, man. What have you. It, it was uh, it's, it, almost like a carry-on film, but um, very, very, very sad. Yeah. Um, so anyway, just to get um, up to date, what happened was there was a management buyout in April of 1984. Uh, this was financed by the Royal Bank of Scotland, and Premier seemed to be doing reasonably well. But it, you know, they were still, still obviously struggling because by the middle of 1987, the bank were, I think, were losing uh, faith in the operation, and Yamaha were looking for a European manufacturing base. So they could get round import duties into Europe, um, and uh, Royal Bank of Scotland, by whatever means, put the two together and said, "Well, I'll tell you what, we've got perfect place for you. It's a purpose-built drum factory. It's already making drums." Yeah. And um, I did hear a story actually that uh, Yamaha were very, very keen to to get in there because they wanted to get their hooks into the premier chroming process. You know the chroming process we talked yeah. about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that was that but but as I said, that was wasn't owned by Premier. That was owned by the family. And the family had gone in nineteen eighty three and they kept the chroming company. So That's... Premier had to I don't know whether they kept using them or they had to go somewhere else. But uh, I have heard uh, a tale that Yamaha were a little crestfallen when you know they, they came down and said, "Where do you do the chrome?" I said, "Oh, we don't do the chrome. We, we send it out to this place in Birmingham." <laughs> yeah, so what? That, that's <laughs> one of those things with the the whole story where you're like, you're like, no, they would have checked that, and then and then you, but you keep with a lot of these companies, you keep hearing things like that, like, no, they they thought they were getting no, that, and they just didn't know. No, trust me, trust me. I know I've worked with some uh, companies, albeit briefly. Yeah, and the 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 guy at the top. Is honestly, uh, sometimes I think, how on earth did you get to where you are now? You, you, how do you remember to put your trousers on the right <laughs> way around in the morning? Hey. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it goes from Selmer to the to the Royal Bank of Scotland, Royal Bank of Scotland to Yamaha. Right. So Yamaha, um, they introduced a lot of new manufacturing processes that Premier really benefited from. Um, and they they actually made a line called the Power Five or the Power V uh, kits uh, in England in the factory, um, and they are identical to the Premier X. I think it's APK or XPK. A- APK, sorry, because they were wrapped. Um, and uh, yeah, everyone I know or I've spoken to said when Yamaha came in. You know, they didn't. Uh, they didn't change the, the name on the outside of the factory. They didn't change the letterheads or anything like that. They just manufactured in there, and they manufactured certain Yamaha drum lines in the UK there. Hmm. But the Premier, the, the Premier lines continued. But the Premier lines, you could see there was a cross pollination of components and parts and stands, and this went on until I think it was 1992. My memory serves right. And pro, uh, Yamaha just said, decided, no, we don't need this anymore. And they did a deal with the guy at Royal Bank of Scotland who bought it for him to buy it. Mm, uh, he, he took over. 
Uh, he ran the company until 1997. Then he sold it to an American company called Verity, which I believe are a very big organization, or at least were, making speakers and other sort of musical-related um, uh, accoutrement, shall we say. Yeah. Um, I don't think they did a particularly good job of it. I think there was... I got the feeling they thought it was, it was going to run itself, sell itself on its own, um, and it was maybe a little bit more hard work than they were anticipating. There was another British buyout round about the year 2000, 2001. That lasted for, uh, I'm trying to think of the dates now, it all blurs into one because it all, there was another management buyout, then they went into receivership. Then they opened up the next week as a different company. Then he went into the receivership again a year later and uh, opened up, you know, the following Monday. You know, one of those things where on yeah. Friday they go, the company's gone bust. They don't have to pay or any of the suppliers or the employees. Monday morning they open up as a, you know, uh, a slightly different named company. Yeah. Um, and this went on. And then they shut the uh, factory down. And um, sadly, that was demolished a couple of years ago. Oh, jeez. Uh, uh, we've, we've got a supermarket there now. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, production was all transferred to the Far East. And, oh, boy. Um, there's, uh, they have a, an office now uh, in, this, in the Midlands in a place called um, Kibworth. Uh, and I think it's, 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 it's only got a handful of uh, less than 10 people run it now. Hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, oh. it's, uh, it's, it's sad the way it's um, sort of diminished. But, you know, Premier is still out there. And there's a lot of people very unfairly, uh, very cruel about them, you know, saying, oh, they're not going to get back to glory days. But so what? You know, they're still there. They yeah, are they're still making drums. Doing they're still making drums, doing really well. They're really pushing very hard with their um, marching um, side of things. That seems to be their sort of main focus now. And um, I know that they are doing very well in some territories. Um, and who knows? You know, you never know what's around the corner. But there is one thing that they've got, which I think a lot of companies don't really have. There has been some continuity. You know, they were all they were in the same factories. Um, you know, uh, for all that time, yeah. and there was no sort of, there was no break, there was no uh, five-year break, and then somebody who's got absolutely nothing to do with them bought the rights to the name and exactly you know, started make, making them again, which is okay if you want to, you know. That, I don't have a problem with people doing that, but it's kind of, well, hang on, it's not really, you know, it's a it's a DNA strand break, really. Mm -hmm. There at least there's been some. Some, it's been continuous premier since 1922. Mm. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I, I do think people are, are sometimes treat them a little, little bit unfairly because, you know, they're not the company that they were. But, frankly, I'm just glad that they're still around. Yeah. No, many of the companies that were giant in the old days, it's it's rare for a company to to be the same. I mean, I'm trying to think. I'm sure there's some. But, like, even... Like as we were talked about a lot, Ludwig. I mean, Ludwig has been sold so many times and has been, you know, oh, yeah. become kind of a different company. Okay. They're still wonderful and make amazing drums and have very great people um, who I've been lucky enough to talk with. But um, I think Premier and okay. I've had I've had a I had a Janista kit, uh, an Orange Sparkle Janista oh, right. kit. Very nice drums. Yeah. 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 Yes, they were. Um, they were actually the. the they came out, it must have been about 1994 90, when they first came out. And they were like the Signia kits. Yeah. Um, they were like a, a, a product of the Yamaha years. I mean, they weren't made during the Yamaha years. But because Yamaha had come in and changed the way that shells were made and their production uh, methods and the quality went up, because of that, they uh, the, things were really sort of improved, if you like, yeah, uh, and modernized quite significantly. I was just going to say, 
modernized. I think it there was you can kind of see looking at their drums there was a modernization of that. And um Yamaha is a great company too. I mean they they do a lot of good stuff. So I, I you know. Oh yeah, I I'm absolutely. I, mean, I don't want anyone to think that I've got anything against Yamaha. I I love their kits. Uh, I love what they've done. And I love what they did for the drum um, for the um, drum industry in you know pushing the boundaries of quality and you know making people sit up and take notice and, and Tamar are another one as well because yeah. they were a, they were a tiny little um, you know one horse company in the early seventies making what were you know well mediocre drums then suddenly in the mid seventies wow they re- oh, the, the hardware. It was an absolute revelation when that brochure landed on my doormat, <laughs> and so all those, you know, what's this? It's it's a multi clamp. <laughs> it's a multi clamp. Yeah. And what, what are they talking about? Yeah. And boom arm. What's a, what's a boom arm? Yeah. Exactly. Really, in the same way we were saying earlier, Gene Krupa, you know, was a pivotal moment. Certainly in my life, the. Um, the arrival of the, the, the Tamar brochure was like a real eye, eye opener. And I think it probably, even though I was only a youngster, I think for a lot of people in the drum industry, particularly in, uh, uh, in the premier offices, I'll, I'll bet, uh, it was a, a real sort of uh, slap around the chops, shall we say. Yeah, I mean, you know, thing, things change, obviously. And, and I hope that premiere can continue and maybe the name can come back and uh, it, it's still there but I'm, I'm glad we actually had this last bit of the conversation because there's you know as someone who's not super heavily involved with premiere um it's one of those companies where i thought to myself like are they still creating new drums and obviously you, you said they're being made in the east but um i think you know, it's better than nothing, obviously, but it's some companies just go away. So it's good to know that they are still fully functioning and, and, and all that stuff. And, and, and who knows what will happen in the future? Well, yeah. Well, as we said in the nineties, they modernized, they modernized big time yeah. and they were, you know, they were very successful and then they struggled a bit in the early nineties and then they struggled a lot and, uh, had all sorts of, um, all sorts of problems. Yeah. Um, but, the fact is, they survived. They had to move with the times, like a lot of companies did, and a lot of British companies. They 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 suffered from what is called the British disease of thinking they know best. <laughs> what we're doing is the right thing to do. This is how you've got to do it. You know, we don't yeah. care. And I see, it, I, I I've seen it lots of times. I mean, I one of my other interests is. Um, is vintage commercial vehicles hmm. and in the 1950s and 60s britain led the world with you know trucks and lorries and all that and specialist vehicles going and it, it was the only but they they were stuck in their ways this is how you make it this is how you make this sort of thing and then all the other companies um around particularly in europe were moving on were modernizing we're taking these ideas and developing them, whereas, and I think Premier with uh, the same in the sixties uh, to a certain degree, where they said, "Well, this is this is how you know this is how it's done." You know, the Beatles. No, you don't. Yeah. You know, who, who are they? You don't care. It's not. It's a flash in the pan. We're not interested. <laughs> and it yeah. is. A, it is a thing. And we, the same thing happened in in the noughties because we lost. Um, MG and Rover cars, yeah. they went under uh, for the, for exactly the same reason, uh, and it's uh, it, it is a great shame. It's just poor management, and it's like we were saying before. You know, how on earth did you get to be a boss of this company? You're an idiot. Yeah, and I think I think I think we overestimate sometimes our uh, uh, our um, industrial leaders because I think sometimes they come home and they just go. Ooh, got away with it again. Brilliant. <laughs> Another day. Wow. That's yeah, every industry. You know I mean? Yeah. That's so but, funny. Um, but yeah, I, it, Premier are still with us. They are still making a great product. And I think that's, it's something that I think some people might have to uh, check is, you know, stop being such a snob about it. The fact that it's made in the Far East does not make it any the less worthy product. Yeah. They are, they have, they make a quality product, and why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they want to make the best thing 
you know, the most cost effective way they can. And the only way you can do it these days is in the Far East. You just it is just too expensive to do in the UK now. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, you're a great ambassador to the company and uh, and England in general. So I'm, you're the second person <laughs> from the UK that I've had on the show, I believe, if I'm not if I'm not forgetting anyone. So um, so oh, I appreciate you, you Mike. But um, so why don't you really quickly, because we'll we'll wrap up here so we don't get too long. Why don't you tell people about your YouTube series and um, and all that good stuff and where they can find you? Okay, yeah, I'm out of, uh, I, I started up doing a restoration for um, a drummer for a, a band that's very big in Europe here. And I decided that since everybody else and his brother was making videos about everything that they do, you know, while they have for breakfast and taking the dog for a walk <laughs> and that yeah. sort of thing, I thought, right, I'm going to make a video about me restoring this kit. Basically, it all got completely out of control and it became this series called the drum fettler now for those of you who don't know what the word fettle means it's an old word that is used in, in, in it's used in britain and what it means is to take off the um you know like when you make something you'll get a little bit of scurf on the edge if you cut a piece of metal or a piece of wood you get splinters and one fettles away hmm. the bits you don't want. It's, you know, it's almost onomatopoeic and it's, you know, you fettle away the edges and all that. Yeah. And one of the, the great things about the, the British man is he will go to his shed, A, to escape the wife and the kids, <laughs> but also to, fet, to fettle something yeah. in, the, in, in the shed, you know, to keep his mind active. That's so funny. that's where it comes from. It's called the drum, the drum fettle. Love it. Um, but, the first season was, I think, was 14 episodes. And it's just all about me and my trials and tribulations of getting these um, clients' kits in and restoring them and cleaning them up and repairing them. And there's a few educational bits, or I like to think they're educational, about Premier Drums mainly, and their history and what have you. The second season started a couple of weeks ago. There's, uh, I think we're up to episode six. I think episode nice. seven is tomorrow. Wow. So, yeah, if you, if you go to YouTube and search for the drum effect, you've got a lot of catching up to do. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I suggest you get over there this evening and um, I shall be asking questions afterwards. Cool. Well, when this episode finally comes out, whenever that is, I got to, you know, get it all together. I'm sure people can go there and uh, you'll still be doing it and, um, and releasing uh, oh, yes, yes. And, and learn all about everything you're doing, which, um, it's just cool to get your perspective again from, from being me in America. And it's just nice to hear your side of things with all of this. Um, we're not so different. Yeah, well, all. <laughs> no, 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 I don't think so. It's yeah. We're all, uh, we're all drum nerds yep, in one exactly. way or another. And, uh, I just hope I haven't upset too many people <laughs> or shattered any uh, any illusions that they may have had. But um, yeah, no, I'll, the, the, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll keep an eye out for that helicopter. Yeah, the Ludwig, the uh, a superphonic helicopter yeah. coming after you. <laughs> yeah, that's it. They'll, they'll be. Uh, the, oh, hang on! Look, yes, I can see them. The gathering at the edge of the garden, the burning sticks. <laughs> There's lots of them. Oh boy! Well, then we better let you go and and uh, take care of that. So, <laughs> all right, I'll, I'll I'll release the hounds. Perfect, Mike. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show, and I wanted to give a big thank you to, uh, similar to the the Gary Astridge episode, you were recommended to me by Andy Dwyer, um, who passed your information okay. along as, as being a uh, premier expert. So, um, oh, thank you, Andy. That's very kind of you. Yeah. And, uh, and that's it. So Mike Ellis, everyone, um, check him out on YouTube at the drum Fettler, F E T T L E R and, uh, keep up with them there. And, uh, thanks a lot, Mike. Appreciate you being on the show. Thanks for having me. I've really enjoyed it. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at drum history and please share rate and leave a review and let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future until next time. Keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.